great that we could be here today and play absolutely. bass for everybody. Absolutely. It's so absolutely, positively wonderful that we could play. However, you won't be articulating in, in, um, in, in any theory lingo. It'll be hard for me and you to talk about theory since neither of us know a damn thing about it. Right, which is why it's, it's good that uh, I should be interviewing you on this occasion. Yeah, but see, we know about a lot more other cosmic um, things that are, are floating around in the universe and, and uh, in this very room today, things that are circling around that hopefully we'll be able to ve be vehicles for these things and let them come pouring through our nostrils today. I think what uh, you and Chad did earlier was uh, very guttural. It was good. Well, you know, with Chad and I were just jamming earlier. This is a spontaneous jam thing, and this is, and this is the type of thing, and that's what my playing is all about as a bass player, is just about jamming. So whatever the vibe is in the room or whatever, if I'm like upset because um, somebody hurt my feelings or if you know, I'm thinking about the makeup girls or something like that, then it might completely change what I play that day or that minute. So you know, everybody knows that that jam that we just did it's, it's very reflection. spontaneous, and jams, sometimes when you jam spontaneously, sometimes it's going to be an amazing, genius, cosmic, beautiful, liquid, f uh, you know, a comet with funk warts on it falling from the heavens, and sometimes you could just have a head like a stale marshmallow that somebody left out, you know, <laughs> that was, you know, that didn't even never made it to a stick to be roasted in a barbecue. <clears throat> was your father a musician? Um, well, not my real father, but my stepfather. Right who raised me was the first person to really expose me to the true magic of music. And, and what was some of that stuff that you uh, got, well, got into earlier? The first thing that I got into, well, he was a jazz musician and he plays the, the upright bass. Mm -hmm. And he just played uh, hard bebop jazz, mm -hmm. you know, the jazz that was real popular with guys like Lee Morgan and Hank Mobley and John Coltrane and Charlie mm -hmm. Parker and Dizzy Gillespie and Miles Davis and people like that. And, you know, he played that upright bass like which is a style which I, you know, that I admire intensely and that I can't play, but which is something that I'm attempting to learn to play. I actually yeah, just bought it. Yeah, last time I was over um, your place, you uh, had an upright bass. Yeah, I got an upright bass. I'm about to begin, to begin studying, and then perhaps I'll be able to elaborate further on that style of bass. But anyway, that was what I saw him play as a child. Mm -hmm. And him and all his friends would come over, and they would jam in my house, and my mom would cook food, and, and they would just play the day away. They'd play all kinds of jazz standards and just jam out. And as a child, my reaction to that was to, you know, roll on the floor in hysterical laughter because it was such a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the first time I was really touched spiritually by music, which I'm sure had a great influence on me ending up okay. being what I'm playing, you know, that I'm a musician and everything today. some of those um, records that you're referring to? The first record that I ever got, which was Louis Armstrong and the Hot Five. And aside from the fact that there was a song on that record called All That Meat and No Potatoes, which I used to just walk around singing all the time when I was a kid, and it went, all that meat and no potatoes, just ain't right like green tomatoes. It had Louis Armstrong, who was probably the greatest musician that ever lived, and I remember I had this distinct memory of, of when I was, uh, when I first started playing the trumpet, before I started playing the bass, and of course I wanted to be as cool as Louis Armstrong, and still my whole life is based on 
one day perhaps, you know, approaching the level of cool of Louis Armstrong and, you know, aging with grace and dignity like he did. But uh, this old guy said to me, this real old guy, and I was playing a trumpet and I thought I was pretty hot, and he said, he goes, let me tell you one thing. He goes, lots of, lots of cats, they play high, they play fast, they play all, with all kinds of technique. You see these guys, they can play every trick in the book and every lick in the book, but no one, no one ever played music like Louis Armstrong. And he was completely right. And that was, you know, a big important thing for me. And that was the first record I ever had. And then from then on, I just started getting all kinds of records. And in that, um, he's just so absolute. In that, every note is just pure, beautiful music. The thing, uh, a great musician plays one note, and it's a beautiful thing. And one note implies that if he wanted to, he could play 10 billion notes. But, you know, just one simple note is a beautiful thing. Right. One time, a friend of mine went to go see a, a Thelonious Monk play the great p pianist Thelonious Monk, and uh, he was playing Carnegie Hall, which is really a prestigious gig for a jazz musician. And uh, he came out, and everybody was there, and they were all excited, and Thelonious Monk came out, and uh, there was a big grand piano with a pot of flowers on it, and everyone was there in their hoity-toity suits and ties and stuff, ready to see the amazing monk do his thing. And he walked out, and he just slammed the potted plants into the into the piano, let the lid sl uh, slam shut, and just went bang and played one note and split. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, that probably would have been the greatest concert ever. I wish I could have seen it. Just that one note. Yeah, just that. When I was a kid and I had my first bass, I wanted to be like Jaco Pastorius, so I, I ruined my first bass because I ripped out all the frets somehow and tried to sand it and I just wrecked like a complete bass and I didn't have a bass. But uh, I gave up trying to be like Jaco Pastorius, I, you know, like as far as my, my influences as, as a musician, they are, I've never tried to be like anybody, but I just try to, I don't want to imitate anybody or be like anybody, but I want to be open to everything. Right. And so, you know, as much as I can dig, like, uh, somebody who would do something like this in a song, you know. <laughs> which is the simplest, most punk amazing rock. thing, punk rock. I can dig something really complex, you know, like... And there's all kinds of, you know, there's, uh, I'm kind of being awkward, but what I'm trying to say is, I is that uh, I, I just love everything that has any soul in it, whether it's uh, the, the simplest simple. punk rock thing or the most complex jazz thing or the deepest, dirtiest, greasiest funk thing. What kind of equipment do you... Um well, condone and, and use in your well, I, I, lo I love this Music Man bass because it's a nice, simple bass and it feels really good. And, and for, uh, you know, doing the thump thing, the, the funk thing, this action. really good for that, the Music Man bass. is really good for uh, playing that stuff. And this is just a great bass, so I'm very lucky to have it. And plus, not only do I have it, but I got it for free because I'm a big pompous rock star. And the richer you get, then they start giving you stuff for free, like you really need it, right? Isn't that weird?
But you know, I don't think equipment really matters at all. I think equipment is really meaningless. I mean, it's nice to have stuff that you like, but the thing is, if you can't feel something with your fingers or with your heart, and if you don't have anything to say with your instrument, then it doesn't matter what you have. Right. You know, so you know, kids that want to play music, if they can't afford to go and buy like the big fancy expensive thing, it really means nothing, because if their heart's in it and they dedicate themselves to the instrument, they'll be better th every time than the. The, uh, the lame-o with the The, the pompous equipment. rock star who gets the equipment for free. Yeah, that could always be better than me. Look what I've grown into. Has anyone ever told you that you sucked? Um, yes, people have told me that I sucked before. How did but you I think people should tell me that I suck more often. Well, I'll tell you that. I, I just told you that now in, in a roundabout way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but the thing is, like, everything in life relates to music, so if someone told me I sucked, like, in some other way, I w it would be just like I sucked in music, like, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know. Right. Like, the first time I did, a, uh, I, I did karate when I was a kid, and I went to do a flying sidekick to break this board, and I fell flat on my face. <laughs> I did it about three times in a row in front of all these Boy Scouts and a Boy Scout Jamboree. I was really upset. Envelope filter. The, uh, the coolest one was used by Bootsy Collins and it was called a, Mutr a Mutron. And you know, but he had the whole space base and, and plus he had his, like, his secret special cosmic brain twirling around at an unbelievable liquid pace through his whole body mm -hmm. so he could do anything he wanted. But anyway, he used these boxes. I used this envelope filter to uh, try to get that kind of funky sound, so sort of that underground, underwater sound, that funk Didn't sound. You play the So that's what happens when you, you press on that thing. That sounds the great. envelope filter. It's a funky thing. So what you were just You have to be there. loyal to the funk though. If you're gonna play funk, you have to be completely loyal to the funk. If you ever water down your funk, then you might as well not play. And if you're gonna play at all, you have to listen more than you play, because if you just play, you can play, you'd be the coolest guy in the world, you know, you can play like faster than Al Dimiola and do it with only one pinky, and if you don't listen to what's going on around you, then you know, you might as well just shut up. A little philosophy there. Mm -hmm. What you're doing here is stream of consciousness, it's uh, improvisation. That's all I know how to do is improvisation, because I can't, really, I can't read music at all. Understood. And I don't know anything about, you know, all the letters and the numbers and stuff, so all I can do is spontaneously improvise and... So those of us fields. who are, are watching this and I do read music, but would like to learn to uh, expand our, our mind in that spontaneous realm of, of freedom. Well, you have to be, to expand your mind in spontaneous improvisation, the only thing that you can possibly do to be good at it, besides listening to lots of good records, is to, as far as expressing yourself, is just to always be true to yourself and true to your own emotions. That's the only thing that matters. And of course, being you know, absolute and, and on top of it and listening just, to Just, you know, happening. being direct with, your, with yourself and laying your naked emotions on the table for everyone mm -hmm. to, uh, 
make fun of if, or, or admire or do whatever they do, but you right. gotta put it out there. Mm. I used to play in this punk rock band called Fear. Mm -hmm. It was one of the first bands I was ever in, and uh, almost all of the bass lines and all the songs were just complete, simple punk rock. You know, it was just, it was just all like, you know. That. Right. And that, the whole concept of that music is just, you know, punk rock is you have to be jumping out of your skin the whole time. You have to play every single note as hard as you can, and you have to expect that after each note that something, somebody is going to shoot you in the face or kill you, and that's how important each note has to be because you have to know that you're about to die, and it's the most important note that you ever play. Mm -hmm. So... The absolute uh, Yeah, conviction. just the, you know, purity. You have to be as... as as convicted as like uh, a Japanese guy, an intense Japanese guy that's about to commit Harry Carey, you know, and he was really taking destiny into his own hands and killing himself because he wants to be so pure, he wants to die pure and die himself. Mm -hmm. So that's a purity you have to have. Wow. So then anyway, so that punk rock thing, and then you're getting, in, getting into a, uh, then I, I got into funk, I mean I was always into funk, but you know, people like Bootsy Collins and Larry Graham and the Meters and Sly and the Family Stone and, you know, just all kinds of, there's so many great funk that I'll always leave out some of the best ones, but, you know, so just that funk groove. George Clinton? Yeah. And then, and you know, and the, the people playing funk, uh, we're doing the, the thumb and this deal, slapping, popping and slapping as it is called. And anyway, so I, where I kind of put my twist on things, you know, not like in a contrived way of thinking about it or anything, was that I was into both of these things so much that I uh, did my own style of the, of the thing, of, you know, just thumping it and attacking it with, uh, you know, very viciously and with all of my might and, you know, and lots of Chili Peppers songs, or, you know, where I did bass lines like that, like on the one Skinny Sweaty Man, where it's like... Or Black Eyed Blonde. Get up and jump. Yeah. You know, and there's probably a bunch of other ones too. So, but that's where that kind of comes from, is just loving funk, but also understanding that punk rock intensity. And I don't think anyone can be a good uh, rock musician today unless they can relate to punk rock, because it was such a, uh, completely changed the face of rock music. And there's a lot of rock musicians that kind of like ignored this whole era of music and never really got into it. And always, mm -hmm. you know, if they don't understand it, there's always something missing. Well, you could tell who those people are. Yeah, should I do one of those bass lines slow, so maybe if someone wanted to figure it out, they could? Yeah, that'd be fun, because I'd, I'd like Okay, that. it's nothing special or anything, but it's a cool lick if it's played with conviction and with the right feel. It's just, uh, here's how it is fast. And if you do it slow, it's like this. So that's how that goes. And that's the deal with the fast popping thing. What was that last song that you were playing? Get Up and Excuse Jump? Me. Yeah, Get Up and Jump. Let's oh. see that slower. Let's hear it fast first. Uh. 
and the slow, it's like this. so easy. I have a question. Here's a good question. Uh, do you write, for instance, that get up and jump, did you write that slow and then no. just sped it up? No. Well, I don't actually write anything because I don't do any writing. I just come up with grooves, but no. Uh -uh. I just started doing it. I just did it fast and it sounded good. It's something that me and Halal used to do, you know, who was with such a huge influence on me. Halal Slovak, who basically gave me my whole like insight into the string instrument playing the bass. He was so important. But um, I don't know what else to say about the popping and slapping thing, except that, uh, you know, I think that uh, Kim Gordon from Sonic Youth said it best when she said that, uh, you know, there's all these uh, guys in bands now be doing this like macho bass uh, funk slapping thing, and I don't really like it. I have to kind of agree with her. I think it's kind of getting played out, you know, and it, instead of being like an art form, it's kind of becoming a macho jock thing. And, uh, you know, that's pretty uh, an insensitive, lame way to be, you know. Yeah. Not that, like, sports is, is always about macho jockism, because sports is, are beautiful art forms. But, you know, as far yeah. as the bass playing itself, you know, it can be a, a lot kind of... of a exploited. The, most, the main thing to remember is when you, you're doing this, Is that uh, that's something that's really fancy and and you know it's really obviously ornate and fancy and you're like you know you're showing you're kind of showing off when you're doing something like that so it has to, there has to be a dynamic you know there always has to be a dynamic because you can't play that good you can't play something like and make that like beautiful art and play fancy like that unless you can play something really simple and sweet to go with it so there's a dynamic so it you know it's nice so if you could play something Simple and nice, you know, just something, anything, you know. If you can't play something simple and beautiful next to something hard and fast, then neither of them you know, will ever have the full impact that they should have and neither of them can ever stand up and, uh, and be their thing. And so anyway, to be, all, to be fancy like that and to be a bass player, you, know, you have to make sure that you're not a victim of a guy who's all flash and no smash. Because mm -hmm. to be all flash and no smash is to just to, you know, to not be a good musician. Mm -hmm. So you have to have some smash with your flash. Chili Peppers concert, for me, you know, it's such a physical thing. You know, there's so many pe peaks of, of physicality where I have to put my whole body and everything into it and just to, to do it right anyway. And uh, so I need to get the physical thing happening and get my muscles and everything really warmed up. So what I do is I just do these exercises that just get me warm. And I was taught to do exercises by Spit Sticks, who was the drummer in Fear, who taught me that it's really good to warm up and then you can play hard and fast for a long time and not cramp up or get tired mm -hmm. or whatever. So I just do really simple things to warm up. I start real slow 
and I just do these these uh, major scales. I just go up the neck doing that. And then I do chromatic ones like this. But I start even slower than I'm going now. I start real slow, you know, and just up the neck. You've already done this today? Um, I did it a little bit today before we started, but not a lot, because I'm not really playing a gig or anything. So anyway, so I do that, and then I do, I do a popping thing to warm up, which is how I figured out how to slap and pop. Was the first thing I figured out how to do was to do the E octave like this. What? That was the first thing I ever figured out, and then I started going. And then I started doing it faster and faster. Anyway, so what I do to warm up, I go like this, up and down the neck. And then I do it like this, you know. I go like a, 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 wait. What the hell do I do? I'm blanking out. And so I do the warm-ups, you know, and I just, just I start playing slow, and I just do it, get harder and harder, and I do it for about 45 minutes, and then I'm really warmed up, and I feel like then I don't have to worry about the, the physical aspect of playing getting in the way of whatever I want to do. Can I see that particular pattern again? Uh, it's the right hand slower. Or the right so hand. So that they can... Uh... Good luck. It's really easy, you know? It's really a simple thing. It just kind of looks fancy. And, you know, sometimes it sounds good, and sometimes you sound like an overindulgent jerk. You just have to know when to do it. It takes uh, a lot of practice and uh, hard work, but like you say, it's easy. Yeah, but I, I mean, you know, it. nothing that you play can ever be, you could never play a single note that's good if you don't have lots of love in your heart for things that are pure and beautiful. I mean, even if you're like a, a guy that, that's not pure and beautiful um, himself or a girl that's not pure and beautiful herself because they've done things that they've lied to themselves or lied to other people and so their soul is not as pure and as happy as it could be if they just actually have a true love in their heart for things that are really you know righteous and, and uh, they're not um, mean or cruel people and they mind their own business then they can be a good musician but unless you're all of those things and, and you're you know, you have love in your heart. You can't play good unless you have real love in your heart. T Bone Burnett uh, once T. told me, you know T, mm -hmm. that that the, the the word that we all need to remember is generosity. Uh huh. That's right. And, uh, you have to be generous to be able to play. In a band, yeah, yeah, if, yeah. yeah. Well, to play in a band, it's like. That's why I even feel silly doing this thing and saying, you know, look, I can play bass and I'm pretty bitching and I do this and that. Because it all means nothing if you can't get together with other people and play to other people, with other people. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole thing, is listening to other people and playing with other people. And you can't ever listen or play with other people unless you love them. Unless you have, like, really true, sincere love. It means nothing. Because you can't even be angry and have true hatred, which is also an important thing to playing, unless you have real love. Mm -hmm. So that's the deal with that. time that I ever play with a pick is if I have a pick in my hand and I don't have one now so I can't play with one but if you have a pick you just go like that <laughs> if you have fingers you go like that I mean um I don't the only time I ever used a pick was when I was playing in fear light. and they told me I absolutely had to play with a pick and I had to play all downstrokes and go like this no upstroke. You know? 
No, you weren't allowed to do upstrokes. That was considered wimpy in punk rock. Really? Or in the fear style of punk rock. If you put, if you went like this, like if you had a line to go bibba dibba 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 and you went like this, you were, you know, not cool. But if you went like this until your, you know, your penis popped off, you know, I can't even do it now. I used to play it all the time. Then you're cool because, you know, then you, because then you separate every note. That all the note, when you go up and down, you're like ba 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 ba. But if you go all straight, all down strokes, then you go ba 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 So, you know, but I really don't use a pick unless I have to. Like sometimes I use it to do this uh, once in a while. What did I use it for? I think it was really cool. I probably can't even remember it. It was just like a. And I can't even remember what it is, and that's probably not it. And I never use a pick anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Okay, I so think you can get the same sound as a pick if you just play back here, you know? And Where the strings are taut. I have to admit, I do like the sound of a, a good hard pick on a bass every yeah, I once mean, in a while. Yeah, I mean, you know, so a lot of my favorite bass players used picks, you know? use picks. I mean, um, there's certain people like I think the guy in Fugazi, Joe Lally, who's such a great oh, yeah. bass player, he plays these really cool like big warm round sounding almost reggae like bass lines and he uses a pick, you know, and it sounds cooler than hell. So, you know, it doesn't really matter if you use your picks in your fingers. I mean, if you have something cool to play, then you're going to play it, you know, whether you, you beat your shoe on the bass or something. Well, guitarists that go to bass uh, have, have a real hard time getting off the yeah. pick. And plus, I mean, one of the greatest bass players of our time, Sid Vicious, used to pick. So, Flea, let's cover the fingers. Let's the cover technique. all of the fingers. All the fingers. Not okay. just these fingers. Let's start with all let's the fingers. Okay, well, there's these two fingers, and as we've said before, what we like to do with these two fingers is walk up and down the strings. We alternate the fingers, right, left, right, left. You see, there you go, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. Everybody knows that. I mean, if you start playing a bass, you learn that. And then, you know, you start becoming more graceful with it as you go along, and, you know, you just do it. You, you, you know. Um, Jaw Wobble is a great bass player. If any kid cares about uh, being a good bass player, he should uh, listen to Jaw Wobble. Being a good or she. bass player. Or she. She or he. Oh, because there's so many great. One of my the biggest influences on me of a bass player, there's a band called Defunct which was a, a huge influence on, on the Red Hot Chili Peppers, on uh, really turning us on to the whole funk thing. And the bass player in that band was a girl named Kim Clark, and she's so great. And of course, there's Kim Gordon. I wonder why it is that girls that play bass are called Kim. It must be some sort of cosmic thing. Was it talking head girls' names? And Tina Weymouth, that's right. All those good girl bass players. Right. So the fingers, the fingers. So there's this one, you know, and... Are there any exceptions where, would you ever go, is it always left, right, left, right? Um, I always do it left, right, left, right, because it seems to be the most convenient way to do it, and it's just the way I always do it, I don't know. But I mean, I'm sure there's other ways to do it. You know, like I say, some people use all their fingers. And another thing is to use the, uh, you can use your thumb, which I do once in a while, you know, I'll be like, uh, use my thumb and these fingers and, So some people use a pinky too? Um, probably. Wow. They probably do use a pinky. But some guys are just so slick when they use all three fingers, you know, and they can just go whenever they want. The dude's crazy fish guys. Bone. Fishbone? Norwood? I heard the greatest Norwood bass lines the other day on the new Fishbone album that they haven't made yet. Norwood's such a great bass player. But, um, and okay, so the, the plucking thing you know, and also, you know, you can use it like kind of, I think it's called arpeggiating if you play, you know, like that, you know, and...
hiking like that. And uh, there's another thing I was thinking, oh, to do with fingers that I do sometimes is I, you know, use both fingers and hit two strings at the same time. Like that, here I'm hitting the D string and a G string at the same time. And then if I go like that, you know, then I could go. some kind of Indian or something kind of Middle Eastern mode or something or other. But, um, you know, I'm just hitting two strings there and using the open string. And using the open string is always nice, you know, when, if you're playing, like I think earlier when me and Chad were jamming, I was doing something like using the D open string, like I was playing this fast popping thing uh, in D, you know, like something like that. Or, and if you hit, and so you, you know that I'm playing in the key of D, so that whole D open string, you can always kind of slip it in there and just, you know, pull off the open string like. So, you know, I'm doing that little deal there. And, um, you know, on the two notes at once, we did that, you know. Feels good. Sounds good. <clears throat> yeah. Now, let's, let's address your uh, left hand. The left hand is pretty simple, I mean. You know, there's the exercises to make it stronger and stuff, and you just press down on the on the bass there. <laughs> it's really a, you know nothing unique about pressing down on the string to uh, change the notes. You know, because if you're playing like this, then you press down, voila, you go to a different note. So, you know, and then it just boils down to you know what's eking out of out of your uh, your soul for what notes you're gonna you're gonna play when you press down there. And right now, at this very moment, I can't think of a single cool thing to play. But that could change in a matter of seconds. But when it does, I'll play something. Okay. Um, the fingers. Is there any other aspects of the fingers? There's something I also like to do with my, my thumb sometimes is, um, you know, I'll be playing with a... You know, we're doing something like that. And I'll just start hitting it like that. Like, you know, a punk rocker with a pick, he might start going, you know, he would go like this, you know. Right. And I'll just start going. And just hit it, you know, and you could either hit one string with your thumb like that, or you could hit two strings, or three strings, or four strings. But so, you know, that's another way. You can just hit it. Or you can even just hit it with your hand, you know? Right. The attack then is, is really on the release. It's about, you won't get that sound out until it's, it's the release. Yeah, well, you gotta hit it and, you know, you just gotta hit it. I mean, if you just keep your hand there, then you're gonna be really crazy and you're gonna go. Exactly. And that's a great sound in itself. It is I could sit there all day and just go like this. Rocker. Rock and roll. Rocking chair syndrome. Okay, a rocking chair. Dump truck driving down a road, loses brakes, goes off the cliff.
manic woman tripping on the umbrella. It's just the the, uh, the solemn manic woman just tripping on her umbrella. Okay. Uh, Clara goes to see the ducks at the pond. She joins in and swims along. There's Claire swimming, I guess, here now. With her floaties. Yeah, with her floaties on her arms. Claire going to the tattoo shop to get a, a tat like her daddy's. No, no! She wouldn't go. She just she doesn't want one. Too young. Yeah. But you you want a tattoo uh, oh, of fashioned of, after one of her drawings. Yeah, because she's such a great artist. If I could ever approach, see little kids, I just love little kids, and little kids are the best musicians and the best dancers and the best writers, performers, drawers, because you know, they're not thinking about worrying about what anyone's gonna think about it. They're just going straight for the expression. So, you know, the best thing a musician can be is a little kid. <laughs> guys that play sitars and stuff like that they do it all the time like they have a droning note and then they play right. a melody right so it's the same thing of just droning and then doing something on top you know The, the droning note. The one note is always droning. that syncopation a lot. Thank you. 
Good to be able to sing the same note that you're going to play, because you know, because if you can, I think probably a real a really good way. Sometimes if I'm trying to think of something and if I feel like it's just not flowing naturally, instead of trying to play it on the bass, I'll just sing something cool in my head, you know, because it, it's kind of that's easier sometimes. You can just sing any old nice thing that you like in your mm -hmm. head and figure out how to play, you know. That's just like learning something off a record or something if it's already there sitting in your head for you to to copy. Mm -hmm. Elaborate on how you achieve synchronicity with a fellow musician, uh, specifically, uh, <clears throat> let's say, a drummer, because it's uh, so rhythmically Well, I mean, first, of, you just have to, uh, for me, to play with a drummer, um, you know, I have to uh, just listen to the guy, and, and instead of, like, coming, the best way to come into a jam with, with any other musician, but in this case, we're talking about a drummer, is not coming in with, unless it's a situation where you have something written and you want him to play it. If you're going to jam, which is what I usually do when I play, you know, unless I'm doing a show and playing songs that are pre-programmed, you know, with, with room for improvisation in them, um, the main thing is, is just not to come in with an attitude of, of you already know what you're going to do. You have to come in and be open and listen to, to what's happening in order to, uh, to fully, you know, create the, the telepathy that you need to have with another musician in mm -hmm. order to improvise with him. And uh, if you're me and you're jamming like me, the, if, you, if you were me, you're pretty ignorant about a lot of things about music and you don't know a lot about chord changes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So you just kind of, uh, you know, jam on, on, you know, modally and, and you just do what you can, you know. Um, and I think because of, like, for me, jamming out, because of my ignorance of a lot of things about music, there's other things that I do, you know, which have made me what I am. Like, because of, it's like if you chop off somebody's leg, you know, the rest of their body gets stronger. So there's certain things that, that you know, that make people, you know, that make me good at certain things that I do, that make people like me. And so I guess that's good. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, anything is good if you, if you do it with commitment. But I, you know, the more, I'm just saying, because I know so little about, te about techno things in theory, it doesn't mean that that's a good thing. It means that I make the best with what I got and I jam with what I've got. But if I knew more about technical things in theory, then I would just have more options with which to express myself. So why don't anyone to think that I'm like saying it's great to be an ignoramus? I'm just saying that that's what I am. So I just do my very best with what I've got. And but you've I done that too. Yeah, but I would love to learn, you know, other things about music. So well, I that's where I'm at right now musically too. I just want to understand the universal language, you know. So yeah. like math uh, can articulate yeah, so you the can, scientific world. And, exactly. You know, it's, it's a language. E exactly. And um, I say, above all, just don't be lame. Be true and don't be lame. Be true to yourself and never listen to it. If, if someone says something to you and, you know, if you don't think that it's right and you don't think it's cool, then just don't deal with it. Just be true to yourself and just play what you like the best that you can and just be yourself as hard as you can and do what you do as best as you can do it. Where you want to be pretty and pink like a soft rose growing in the springtime, then be that as pretty and as beautiful and as slippery as you can. And if you want to just be like the biggest, ugliest monster that scares everybody away, do that as best as you can. If you want to be a clown in the circus, be a clown in the circus. If you want to be an upright golden statue of liberty, then be an upright golden statue of liberty. But just do whatever it is that you do and be true to yourself and be yourself and just play your hardest and your best and, and uh, you know, always just play every note like it's your last is what I have to say. And just really care. And if you really care, then you'll get somewhere.